Yes. Okay. So yesterday we saw. Can can you take page lesson number thirteen? That is page number one hundred and twenty-three in your book. Okay, page number one hundred and twenty-three. So we saw what was India after independence. Okay, so India was uh, facing the you cannot say the uh, problem, but it was facing the challenge of uh, accommodating the refugees. Okay, and nearly fifty million refugees came to India. and then it was the making of democracy in that we had that universal adult franchise to be started and then we wanted to ensure that we have equality in our democracy we we were uh, about to reorganize the princely states that we had according to linguistics okay then there comes the economic development i am on page number 124 children the economic development it was very necessary because as we studied in all the previous lessons how the britishers had destroyed the indian economy okay we had a traditional economy which was thriving good but then they destroyed the indian economy traditional economy so now the planning commission came up they were planning for all the um, big industries in india so after that only big big industries came like tesco and so many other tata industries and other steel industries and big manufacturing textile industries all developed in india okay and then india came up with a foreign policy what we should do so india along with others they planned to have a peaceful coexistence nam was a thing which was started in which they said that we are not going to take the side of usa or ussr so we are going to have a peaceful coexistence and also respect for the sovereignty of all nations all of all the nations have their own sovereignty and we are going to respect it and respect for all the rights of all the nations to be free and to ha have no external aggression that nobody should come to attack so that's what was india's policy and another thing was equality so all the countries on the world stage had to be treated equally so this was india's policy which jawaharlal nehru forced after independence okay we call it nam non aligned movement then now what is the condition of india after independence is that communalism was there communalism means it it is almost like communities okay this person belongs to this community that community we have studied in de detail in the previous lessons so there were communal rights like sikhs were fighting there in punjab they wanted a separate sikh land and uh, there was a godra uh, fight there in gujarat they wanted a separate land bodo bodo land in assam they were fighting to have a different so this kind of communal rights were also going on which also the government had to face after independence and then not immediately okay as they went along the way and then comes illiteracy illiteracy also was uh, like a very um, powerful factor that affected the growth of india okay so compulsory education for children till 14 years of age was also started mid day meals were started for the children so that they can stay at school they can have their lunch and then they can carry on with their studies okay this scheme was also started in india then there was a lot of caste based discrimination and there's no need for me to explain all that it was like untouchability women and children they were neglected in the society and negligence negligence was there for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe also and also we had less of public support for this because india is a traditional country so we were following all that so caste based discrimination was there then there was poverty the rich were becoming richer the poor were becoming poorer so wealth was not equally distributed even today even today uh, okay obia even today wealth is not equally distributed see some people live in 24 story house their own house one house has 24 stories some people have only 10 square feet place just to put one cot and live over if you go to bombay and all you go to the chal and see i have seen the condition is so poor 
it's a tin house okay where dhirubhai ambani ambani's father first he stayed okay those places tin houses they have double story also in the tin house there will be only one single room okay and that place will be kitchen and that place will be bedroom and that place will be living room toilet and all they have to go outside they have to stand in long queue if you, if they have to go to the toilet one or two public toilets will only be there and then you won't believe some of the children will sleep on the cot and some will sleep under the cot so this is the condition ah so some people live like this so wealth is not equally distributed that was a problem again over population also was a problem india had much population as you know that we are the second largest populated country in the world then we started having a foreign policy we started having economic and financial and technical um, ties with other countries so we started getting aids from them and we started developing our what you call um, industries okay for our uh, benefit so this kind of thing also happened a uh, border dispute we had with pakistan and also with china and especially with jammu kashmir and all so it was all like i'm on page number 127 so all these things our government had to deal with okay so bangladesh china and uh, bhutan and pakistan on the borders right there they were always in some or the other struggle with india so this is the chapter now children i would like to show you some videos exactly what happened on the day the night of the independence and then what followed okay so shall we go uh, into the videos and see just a minute Did you know there's a reason why India celebrates Independence Day on the 15th of August? And that too, it was first celebrated at midnight. Let us understand why. Why 1947? In Feb 1947, Lord Mountbatten was appointed as the last Viceroy of India to oversee the transfer of power. The plan initially was to transfer power from Britain to India by June 1948. But there were conflicts between Jinnah and Nehru on the matter of partition, and they could not come to any consensus. Also, Jinnah's demand for a separate nation had instigated large-scale communal disturbances across India. Hence, this forced him to prepone the date of independence by almost a year. Why the 15th of August? Lord Mountbatten had personally decided the date of August 15th because he had considered that date to be very lucky for his career. During the World War II, it was August 15, 1945, that the Japanese army had surrendered before the Allied forces, of which Lord Mountbatten was the commander. Why midnight? 15th August 1947 was an unfortunate and unholy date, according to astrological calculations. But Lord Mountbatten was adamant on August 15th. Thus, astrologers suggested the midnight hour between August 14th and 15th due to the simple reason that the day according to the English starts at 12 a.m. but according to the Hindu calendar starts at sunrise. And folks, this is how a great country attained independence on the 15th of August 1947. Some years ago, we made a trip with destiny and now the time comes when we shall redeem our trip. Not only or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. The departure of the first contingent of British troops from the new dominion of India was an historic event. 
Governor General, Lord Van Batten, is on Ballard here from Play. And here he inspected the guards of honor from the three Indian services, mounted as a tribute to the work of the British services in India. Lord Mountbatten then addressed men of the 2nd Battalion Royal Norfolk and RAF personnel, speaking, as he remarked, in three different capacities, as the Constitutional Governor General, as the ex Viceroy, and as the former Supremo of Southeast Asia Command. After the speech, the men embarked on the Georgia. Lord Mountbatten himself went aboard for last farewells to the men and their families. He remains as Governor General at the invitation of the Indians themselves, a fine testimony to the straightforward manner in which he has carried out his difficult job. As Lord Mountbatten said, with the departure of the British forces, the outward and visible sign of British rule in India disappears, and its place is taken by something much more valuable, a really great friendship between the British and the Indians. and mental terror that the Indians faced over the years couldn't be wiped out in a day's time. And when India became independent in August 1947, it faced a series of big challenges. As the aftermath of partition, about 8 billion refugees had come into the country from Pakistan. These people had no homes, no jobs, as overnight they were uprooted from their very communities. Until date, when the survivors talk about the time of partition, one can see the pain in their eyes. Then there were as many as 500 princely states, and each of them was ruled by a Maharaja or a Nawab. Now the new formed government had to pursue each of them to give away their status and join the newly formed nation. Moreover, these problems of the refugees and of the princely states had to be addressed as in the longer term, the new nation had to adopt a political system that would best serve the hopes and expectations of its population. Now, in the year 1947, India had a population of almost 345 million people, and this population was divided. There were divisions in terms of high caste and low caste, in terms of Hindu community, who consists of the majority of the population, and the other Indians who practice their respective faith. Also, the people of this vast land spoke different languages, wore different kinds of clothes, ate different kinds of food, and practiced different professions. So, how could they be made to live together under the umbrella of one nation state? In addition to all these problems, yet another challenge that India faced was to ensure development. During the time of independence, the majority of Indians lived in the villages. Farmers and peasants depended on the monsoon for their survival. And so did the non-farm sector of the rural economy because if the crops failed, barbers, carpenters, weavers, and other service groups would not get paid for their services either. Again in cities, factory workers lived in the crowded slums with little access to education, healthcare, or sanitation. So from what we have discussed so far, it is evident that the new nation had to take its masses out of poverty. And for that, the government had to come up with ideas and technology to increase the productivity of agriculture and new job-creating industries. Also, unity among its population could only be ensured if there was proper development. Also, it was high time that the divisions between the different sections of India be eased. Otherwise, this could have led to violent and costly conflicts between high caste and low caste, Hindus and Muslims, and so on. And along with all these, if the fruits of economic development was not distributed evenly among its citizens, then fresh divisions could not be created. For example, between the rich and the poor, between the cities and the countryside, between regions of India that were prosperous and regions that lacked so on one hand, while there was celebration that finally India was independent, and on other hand, there was uncertainty about the future at the same time. 
Further, within less than six months post independence, the nation was born. On the 30th of January 1948, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated by the right wing or RSS follower, Nathuram Gorse. Gorse's reason behind the assassination was that he disagreed with Gandhiji's conviction that Hindus and Muslims should live together in harmony. That evening, a stunned nation heard Jawaharlal Nehru's moving statement over the All India Radio, and I quote, friends and comrades, the light has gone out of our lives. There is darkness everywhere. Our beloved leader, the father of the nation, is no more. After independence, India was formed with three years between December 1946 and November 1949. Around 300 Indian leaders had a series of meetings on the country's political future. And these were the members of the Constituent Assembly. The meetings of this Constituent Assembly were held in New Delhi, but the participants came from all over India and from different political parties. These discussions resulted in the framing of the Constitution of Democratic India. And the Indian Constitution came into effect on the 26th of January, 1950. One of the most important features of the Constitution was its adoption of universal adult franchise. Another major point of debate in the Constituent Assembly was that of language. Many members believed that with the British rulers, the English language should also be familiar. Many were of the opinion that Hindi should replace it. However, those who did not speak Hindi were of a different opinion. For example, speaking in the assembly, P.P. Krishna Machari conveyed a warning on behalf of people of the South. And some of the members from the South settled to separate from India if Hindi was proposed. So finally, after much debate, the constituent assembly came to the conclusion that Hindi would be the official language of India and English would be used in courts, the service and communication between one state and another. Now, as you can see, many Indians contributed to the framing of the Indian constitution. But perhaps the most important role was played by Dr. P. R. Ambedkar, who was the chairman of the drafting committee under whose supervision the document was finalized. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar or Baba Sahib as respectfully referred to belonged to a Marathi a lawyer and economist himself, he is best known as the revered leader of the Dalits, the father of the Indian constitution. In his final speech to the Constituent Assembly, Dr. Ambedkar pointed out that political democracy had to be accompanied by economic and social democracy. Giving the right to vote would not automatically lead to the removal of other inequalities between the rich and poor, or between the upper and the lower class. He was of the opinion that with the new constitution, India was going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we will have equality, and in social and economic life, we will have inequality. In politics, we will be recognizing the principle of one man, one moon, and one value. In our social and economic life, we shall, by reason of our social and economic structure, continue to deny the principle of one man, one value. So far, we know that after independence, it took our leaders almost three years to frame the Indian constitution, to establish equality amidst the vast diversity that the country had. But was this the end of challenges that our new form democracy had to face? Well, join me in the next video on India after independence to find out what happened next. Until then, you take care. Bye. Due to me. For more amazing video lectures, download the free app on Apple App Store or Google Play Store. India after independence. On 15th August 1947, India celebrated with joy its first day of freedom. But rehabilitation of refugees. The communal violence at that time of independence forced millions of people to cross over either to India or Pakistan. 
the two countries were ultimately obliged to an exchange of population for all those who wanted to immigrate. The Sikhs and Hindus in West Pakistan and the Hindus in East Pakistan migrated to India in large numbers. Rehabilitation of these refugees who had suffered heavily during the migration was a huge task. The problem was not merely giving them immediate relief, but also to resettle them in gainful employment. There was a great strain on the country's economy, which was already crippled by war and partition. Relief camps were opened to give food and shelter to the displaced persons. It was followed by a planned program for rehabilitation. The refugees were accommodated in evacuated houses and newly constructed huts in urban areas. The government and the people of India gave much help in rehabilitating these people. Integration of princely states. At the time of independence, there existed British India under the paramountcy of British Crown. The Indian Independence Act of 1947 permitted the princely states to decide their future either to join Indian Dominion or Pakistan or remain independent. Therefore, the first and foremost task before the new government was the political unification of India and states. There were more than 500 states of varying sizes and population. Some were as big as a province of modern India, while some others were quite small in size. All these states in free India except Kashmir Hyderabad and Junagar joined the Indian Union. Vallabhai Patel, the first Home Minister of Free India, took upon himself the task of integrating these princely states with India. The rulers of the states handed over their states to the government of India. In return, for various concessions, including the privy purses granted to them to enable them to live decently. The Nizam of Hyderabad tried to act like an independent ruler. The police state restricted him from seceding. His state was merged with India. The Nawab of Junagar wanted to accede to Pakistan, although its people wanted to join India. A plebiscite was held there, which went in favor of the India, and consequently, it became part of Indian Union. The Maharaja of Kashmir remained indecisive. The National Conference Party of Kashmir was in favor of joining India. In October 1947, tribesmen from Pakistan and irregular armed forces invaded Kashmir and illegally occupied some parts of it. The Maharaja fled to Jammu and sought the help of government of India. Indian troops went to Kashmir to drive out the invaders. Then Jammu and Kashmir was acceded to India. Trivia. The partition between India and Pakistan claimed the lives of almost 1 million people. 6 million Muslims shifted from India to Pakistan. Around 4 million Sikhs and Hindus moved to India from Pakistan. Liberation of French and Portuguese territories. Even after 1947, few areas of Indian territory remained under the control of the Portuguese and French. The French had occupied Pondicherry Karelkar, Mahi and Yanam in South India, and Chandranagar near Calcutta. Anti-French movements were launched in these territories. The French government used harsh measures to suppress such movements, but the people revolted against French brutalities. Ultimately, the French government had to transfer all the settlements to India on 31st of October 1954. The integration of Goa was not a smooth affair for India. Portuguese were most reluctant to leave their territory. The freedom movement gained momentum in Goa on 15th of August 1955, when thousands of Indian marchers entered Goa, Daman and Diu. There was anger in India and major cities observed Hartal. However, in 1961, Operation Vijay was launched to liberate Goa from Portuguese rule. The Indian forces completed the operation by 19th December 1961, and Goa was liberated. Trivia. Goa was amalgamated to India in 1961.
so you you saw children very clearly uh, what was the reason that they took uh, 15th august 1947 as the independence day and that to the midnight okay as i was telling you yesterday yes and then uh, you saw what all went the indians went through especially the partition unification of princely states and all and the problem of uh, the population illiteracy and caste based discrimination and uh, com communalism and also foreign policy everything okay so this is the chapter i would like you to read it and come to the next class okay anybody has got any doubts you can ask me children yes anyone has any doubt no okay okay did you like the videos could you understand yes okay okay it was very clear and uh, with the what you call pictures they demonstrated actually what happened and how our nation went forward just just exactly after one year of our independence our father of the nation was killed okay assassinated yes so this is how our country was going and because of communalism only mrs gandhi also was assassinated and because of this type of communalism only in the other land mr rajiv gandhi also was assassinated so you see communalism lives it's thriving in some way or the other throughout the ages so that's not good so you people who are the coming generation please you see to it that communalism is totally wiped out from india so you can do it okay children thank you have a nice day